morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, welcome to Capturing Zero Days Exploits with Perfectly Placed Hardware Traps. You are in the Jasmine Ballroom, and this presentation is by Cody Pierce, Matt Spizak, and Kenneth Fitch. Um, before we begin, a few brief notes. Um, please stop by the business hall located in Bayside AB during the day, and for the welcome reception um, from 5.30 to 9 tonight. The Black Hat Arsenal is on in the Palm Foyer on level three, and join us for the Pony Awards in Mandalay Bay BCD at 6.30. Thanks for putting your phones on vibrate. It makes it easier for the rest of us to ignore the ringing while you're waiting for your voicemail to pick it up. And with that, let's get started. Hello. Guess get this mic straight. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as she introduced us, um, we're going to be talking about capturing zero-day exploits with perfectly placed hardware traps. It's kind of a mouthful, but uh, we're going to step through all of it and, um, you know, walk through it. Um, I'm Cody Pierce. I'm a director of vulnerability research at Endgame. And um, with me and presenting with me are Matt Spizak and Kenneth Fitch, who are also vulnerability researchers at Endgame. And uh, let's, let's dive right in. So... You know, we're going to be talking about two main things, and that's hardware-assisted control flow integrity. And they kind of work independently, but we're going to combine them throughout the talk to show you that our research comes out with um, some pretty strong detection. Uh, but um, I'm going to just kind of introduce some of the topics at a high level, and these guys are going to really drill down into the technical aspect of it. Um, so first, to kind of set the stage on, on where we started with our research and why we uh, went down this path, um, as exploit writers and as, as having a lot of experience in exploitation and vulnerability research, we know that um, exploitation is uh, increasingly more sophisticated. It's very dynamic, like all of security. Um, it's um, inherently creative. And so that's one of the maybe differences in, in vulnerabilities and exploitation, that it's hard to plan for the creativity of an exploit writer or an exploit in something like the security development life cycle where you can model, you can, um, you know, you can validate and verify, um, you can do a good job of doing code reviews and things of that nature. But it's very hard to kind of flip that and say, how would I exploit this bug if, if I found it or if someone else found it? And um, we think that kind of adds to the di uh, dynamic nature of exploitation and why it's, it's interesting and why it's also hard to uh, provide defenses and protections for it. And uh, finally, you know, as far as um, an attacker versus a defender, a well-financed um, attacker with zero days that is um, advanced in exploitation is a very, very hard adversary because of uh, how much leverage and, and how much control they might have over the program that you're trying to defend. So this is kind of something I came up with to demonstrate that you know, we have kill chains, we have all these stages of, of persistence and whatnot. It actually happens in, in uh, exploitation as well. There's different phases. So as an exploit begins, it goes through these phases and finally ends in uh, persistence or, uh, you know, backdoor malware actually being put to disk or memory and executed. And so this is to illuminate really what um, we kind of see is under the hood at a high level what happens in an exploit, in, in an exploit as it runs. Um, so you have these three areas. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about pre-exploitation. Uh, I find it incredibly difficult to try to defend on the pre-exploitation side because things like software identification are, uh, they happen so often that your false positive rates are going to be um, extremely high. So the final two is the exploitation phase where, you know, this is the point when the attacker um, is really going from maybe benign to uh, malicious or starting to overtake the program and their exploit is really starting to uh, groom the heap, starting to prepare to trigger a vulnerability, trigger that, defeat ASLR, leak memory, um, and then you know the bottom one is code execution. So they've, they've prepped the environment, they're about to execute their payload, um, whether that's uh, a ROP chain or whatever, and that takes us to the post-exploitation stage, and that's where you have return-oriented programming, you have your payload executing. Uh, COE is something that we, that, that we call a continuation of execution. It's where they repair the process so it doesn't crash and alert a user. And then persistence, and persistence is, is starting to really get into malware um, and, and you know, looking for PE and executables and stuff. And, and so for what we're going to be talking about and where we think there's a lot of strength is going towards this exploitation 
phase and specifically code execution. And uh, Matt will dig into the details of, of what that looks like, but basically what we're saying is um, we want to really stick to uh, early detection and detection at this layer because it gives us, uh, we still maintain the high ground um, as far as a defender when it comes to exploitation. Uh, we'll, we'll show a little bit later that once you get into return-oriented programming, payload execution, you've, you're kind of fighting on the same ground as, as, an, as an attacker. So I'm going to introduce some of the high-level concepts that we'll be talking about. First one is the hardware assistance piece to ours. Um, there's a couple of things we're going to be using that are, are, are in the uh, microarchitecture of the processor. And um, these are to highlight kind of what we'll be digging into a little bit. Um, obviously, we have the CPU core everybody's familiar with. We're going to talk about the performance monitoring unit, which gives us the perfectly placed trap portion of our, uh, of our long title, and um, the branch prediction unit. So the first thing to really go over at a high level is the performance monitoring unit. This is um, a, a unit in the architecture that is historically been designed for debugging, optimization, uh, to get performance events out of a running system. And they're, they're very low level. And there's dozens and dozens of them. And what developers do is they're able to measure uh, how their program executes, um, whether how many, you know, uh, cash flushes, things of that nature, so that they can go back and, and fine tune these things. But, and this is a slide with just some of them. Again, there's, there's dozens, uh, clock cycles and, and whatnot. Um, and you can refer to the Intel manual if you want to really, really get crazy with them. But what, what we're really kind of basing our inspiration off of is a performance monitoring unit as a security device and, and no longer just a device for uh, developers to optimize code. And this is some of the prior art and prior research that was really inspiring to us that came up with a novel idea of using the performance monitoring unit as a security tool for certain things. And this first one um, was our, the first one we could kind of find that, that started to put these uh, building blocks in place. And uh, they built upon that uh, in some follow-on research. And then over the last uh, few years, people have been kind of getting more into this, uh, using different hardware features for exploit prevention. Um, K-Bouncer is a really popular one. Microsoft hosted a Blue Hat prize, and they won the, the top prize for that. And then uh, the uh, next one that was a, um, in a Threads talk. But, you know, then these are focused more on the, the ROP side of things. But again, you know, this kind of got us really pumped about the idea and, and what we could do with it as a security device. So the next one to talk about is the branch prediction unit. Um, the branch prediction unit is another uh, another feature, just like um, the performance monitoring unit. This one's a lot more opaque, and it's not available to program or to really touch. In fact, it's it's kind of a black box. Uh, but the purpose of it is to predict branches, and um, again, back to just making systems more performant. Intel, AMD, all of those all those people with these highly um, you know, multi-cores, multi-threads, um, all these things need to make the systems more and more efficient just to get the most out of them. And so the branch prediction unit is, is a, a fairly large part of that. And what it does is it just, it makes the pipelining of instructions more efficient. So anytime you have a, a, a execution on multiple processors, you have to cache instructions or your performance is terrible. And so what the branch prediction unit is we'll try to pre-cache instructions so that when a branch happens, which can be 20% of code in, in, in a C++ application, um, it's already predicted it, it's already pumped that pipeline and it's ready to go. If it mispredicts, it flushes the cache and it's, it's a really bad performance thing. So again, it's kind of a, it's kind of a black box and uh, so I've included um, a little more about it. Two fully symmetric integer units, that's twice the G4 two load and store units, twice the G4, and massive branch prediction logic, which I don't know what it does, predicts branches. <laughs> I don't know, but it's a good thing. That's how we felt about it, trying to dig into Intel manuals, and it's, it's good to know Steve Jobs uh, said it much better than I could have. Um, so all of these kind of work in concert, right? Like we're, we're using hardware features, but there's so many hardware features that we're using and it's all uh, the purpose of the next piece. But um, again, these guys will go into technical detail. So, um, you know, just to represent the system here. And then, you know, the next piece is control flow integrity. So 
if we have the hardware piece, the control flow integrity is kind of the software piece. And, and what we want to do with control flow integrity, just some background, is it's to enforce legitimate control flow. And it's traditionally done with compiler instrumentation. Um, there's many different uh, policies that you can enforce in control flow integrity, but the basic idea is you want to just validate all control flow. Um, it's a side effect of exploits that, that we see all the time, um, and it's a constant theme, so it's a great place to try to build up a defense there to do detection and prevention. So in normal, without control flow integrity, um, you'll have a control flow transfer jump to a destination. And for an exploit writer, the destination is all a virtual memory that's executable. So, you know, there's, it's just, there's no limitation on what they can call in a lot of cases. And that's where they really get the creativity. And what CFI hopes to do is enforce a policy. Um, so when there is a, a control flow change, there's a policy that checks that it's valid. And if it is, it continues. And if it's not, you have an opportunity as a defender to do something about it. And that may be terminate alert or, or whatnot, dump memory, things of that nature. And so there's a lot of CFI implementations. Uh, it, you know, it's not a new concept. It's been in, in uh, academic research for a long time. Vendors are starting to really kind of push on, on doing uh, control flow implementations. Uh, some that you may have heard of is Control Flow Guard from Microsoft. Uh, Intel just released a specification hope, hoping to get some support on their control flow enforcement technology. And then uh, the PACS team are always coming out with really great uh, mitigations and preventions uh, are doing it as well. So they're, you know, with their indirect control transfer protection, uh, they're able to enforce some, some CFI policies. But what we kind of, where we started our research is we, we knew that there was kind of a gap, right? These uh, all require recompilation. Uh, most of them require new software, new kernels in the latest operating system. So, for instance, Control Flow Guard is 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 uh, much better on Windows 10, um, or or it was when it came out. And some of these are not cross-platform. So we found this as a really green field for us to do some research that would kind of elevate this into into a dynamic runtime CFI uh, using these hardware features. So some of the the, the parameters we set out with were to not have access to source code, to be cross-platform, to support 32 and 64-bit, um, and no pre-processing of binaries. A lot of the research wants to do something called control flat flow graph reconstruction, and it's a really hard problem. So it's, it's kind of better to not try to do that. It doesn't scale well. Um, and then not be specific to certain bug classes or exploit techniques like ROP. And finally, uh, since we were using hardware features and we didn't want the overhead to be something that was unusable uh, in the real world. And uh, finally, before we get into the details of all this, um, I, I wanted to talk about real world verification. Uh, we're, we're huge fans of using real exploits, real software, um, and just as much data as we can get. There's an incredibly rich amount of data in the exploit world that we can harvest to actually test some of these ideas as we begin to research them and prove them out. And uh, uh, Kenneth will get into some of that, but these are some of the areas where we drew from. Uh, Cyber Grand Challenge publishes all of their exploits um, and all their vulnerable programs, so uh, you can check them out there. Uh, research community like Project Zero, all great, great resources to test out these types of things. So with that, um, I'll get over to Matt, who's going to get into the details of CFI. All right, yeah. So I'm going to talk about uh, kind of our overall, uh, the overall approach to our research. And it kind of stems from the main hypothesis that, you know, a hijacked uh, indirect branch is almost always going to be mispredicted by the branch prediction unit. You know, since the, the branch prediction unit uh, is built largely on kind of a branch history, and so the fact that this call site is now uh, jumping to some new address is, is you know, going to be mispredicted. And so that was kind of, um, you know, the, the hypothesis we, we were focused on. And uh, a lot of the prior art has been focused more on, on ROP, as Cody mentioned. And so we instead wanted to focus on, uh, on validating the... Uh, the non-return indirect branches. So, you know, you could have an indirect jump, an indirect call, uh, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But kind of the overall approach we, we went with was um, we're going to use the PMU to trap um, every single time a mispredicted indirect call occurs and then use our interrupt service routine to make the decision whether the branch is valid or not. 
And so, um, and we, we started out working with, with Linux 64-bit just because uh, it's much easier to work on Linux. Um, and so kind of a, a visual high-level picture of the same, the same thing. Uh, and we'll step through each of these, but we've, we're using the hardware-assisted piece, the PMUs giving us that callback at these strategic times. Our interrupt service routine is gonna do some sort of analysis, and then we'll ignore the, the user mode part because we're gonna get into that. But if you're like us, one of your kind of first questions might be, all right, isn't this gonna be very expensive? You're interrupting all these uh, mispredicted branches. And so, um, and through our research, we found that it's it's not not as bad as, as we initially thought. And you know, with with uh, branch prediction unit um, becoming improving through each generation of, of the Intel's microarchitecture, there's sort of a direct correlation there between um, how many mispredicts and, and what the overhead would be. But hopefully, you'll see in the slides uh, that that overhead is not not that bad. And kind of another way to think about it, if you compare some of these different CFI approaches, there's obviously pros and cons to everything. Uh, Cody noted we, we did not want to require uh, recompilation of, of source code. But kind of a different way to think about it is that all of these approaches have overhead. Even if you're compiling in 10 instructions to validate some sort of call, uh, that's 10 added instructions. And since we're using mispredicted branches, that's only going to be a subset a fraction of, of times at that call site, whereas with a, a compiled in or patched in CFI, uh, that that added overhead is going to be applied every single time um, that call site is in, is invoked. But so walking through each of these, uh, so with respect to the PMU, there's been a lot of great uh, talks, uh, threads a couple years ago, Black Hat last year, which really highlighted you know, how to how to write code to, to control the PMU. So we're not going to go into that, but at a high level, there's you know a handful of model-specific registers that you need uh, in order to configure and access the counters and, and, and enable interrupts and clear interrupts. Uh, but the Intel manual is also a great great reference for for the PMU. And as far as uh, indirect indirect branches, uh, there's a couple that that jump out in the manual. There's uh, branches mispredicted retired and, and branches mispredicted uh, executed. Uh, the main difference is the uh, the retired one is a little bit more precise, so we opted uh, for that um, that particular event because more precise means fewer interrupts, which means better better performance. Sure. Uh, so, so the the next part then is our uh, our interrupt service routine, which is kind of kind of making making the uh, the decision or you know doing something once these interrupts occur. And so to kind of, if you're not familiar with the PMU, I, you might, you know, visualizing how this all works sometimes is useful, but we see we've got some some assembly here and in the left left hand column, we've got our counter value, which we've set at minus one. Each time the counter overflows, that's when the, uh, the interrupt will be delivered. And so in an ideal world here, we're counting indirect, mispredicted indirect calls and we see this indirect call occurs, the counter overflows, the interrupts uh, delivered, and then our ISR could just grab the saved instruction pointer from the, the thread that was interrupted. Uh, the problem is that's not how it works uh, all the time. So something called interrupt instruction skid can occur where um, base, you know, and it can be highly dependent on you know, what, what's going on in the system, uh, but as well as where the event where the the overflow occurs in the instruction pipeline, but what you'll often see is is the counter overflows, and then some number of instructions later, the interrupt will finally be delivered. And so because of this, we can't just uh, we can't just use the the saved instruction pointer because there's no guarantee that that saved instruction pointer was actually the branch destination uh, for the the indirect call that was just mispredicted. And uh, so the bottom line is we, we need a more precise way uh, to get that, that branch target address. And that's where the, the Intel's last branch recording comes into play. And the LBR was kind of the you know, main, main focus of the K-Bouncer uh, paper that Cody mentioned. And same with, with, M, with the PMU, the LBR is controlled and accessed through a handful of, of MSRs. A couple, you know, the, the LBR is a circular stack 
that just logs the, the most recent branches. And a couple of the MSRs to note, the uh, LBR select allows you to control what type of branches are logged. Uh, and the, uh, the top of stack gives you the offset into the, into the LBR register so you know which, the, which was the actual last branch that occurred. And so with that LBR select MSR, uh, I've highlighted the, the, highlighted the bits here that, that we can set to zero so that we can basically tell the LBR to only log branches, indirect calls that occur in user mode. Um, and then interestingly in the, the LBR registers from the actual from and to addresses, in the from we, can, we see this mispredicted bit um, which we can use to sort of validate that, yeah, the branch was actually mispredicted uh, because we found that on occasion you'll get a, a mispredicted branch and either the, the branch wasn't actually mispredicted or it wasn't, wasn't logged to the LBR because it wasn't uh, the appropriate call type. So once we, we add the LBR, then we can, we can take care of this instruction skid issue. So the next time we see this, you know, some number of instructions past the entry point uh, to foo here, uh, we finally get our interrupt delivered and our ISR can then just read the top of the stack off the L LBR. We see this entry <clears throat> jumping from 1007 to foo, the address of foo, and then we can take that address and apply our CFI policy, whatever that may be, uh, you know, to validate the destination. So at this point, we had a system uh, in place that could basically trap and, and capture the, the branches that, that were mispredicted. So what do we do with that data? So our first our first iteration, we basically just piped all of these branches to user space and dumped them into a big pile of, of branches and then so that we could kind of post-process the data. And uh, uh, we, we really wanted to work with, with real-world data, so kind of our first, our first success was we, we took one of the CyberGrand challenge samples. Uh, this, was a, this particular sample is a use after free, and we profiled our system on this, this uh, particular program and we can see at the end this mispredicted branch which actually denotes the hijacked call we can see it trying to jump to 414141 and so from there you know we can look up and see the 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 uh, assembly for from the from address to see what the, the call was and and the appropriate source code but the bottom line here for us was this was kind of a validation that um, you know we're we're moving down the right path um, so from there we wanted to work with with uh, a little bit more real-world data, so we uh, we chose a, an ex a uh, proof of concept exploit for a flash bug uh, from Chris Evans, and uh, at the time we were working with Linux 64-bit, and this particular POC worked uh, quite well on on 64-bit Linux. So we we went through the same procedure. We uh, profiled Chrome, uh, captured all the mispredicted indirect calls, but then when we kind of looked through the data, we didn't see the hijack showing up. And as it turns out, the reason was, as you can see, uh, his, his particular trigger was on write bytes, which uh, actually resulted in an indirect jump being mispredicted. And so this kind of uh, inspired us to, to uh, explore a couple things. So first, uh, we, we kind of rewrote the POC to instead hijack uh, different virtual functions for the byte array object, uh, and then this basically gave us two things. One, it gave us a bunch of unique data data points. So one vulnerability, 16 data points of unique call site hijacks. Uh, but it also kind of gave us some insight into you know, how often are we going to deal with an indirect jumping hijack versus a call. Um, and so from there, we became kind of curious on uh, just in general. So we applied some Ida Python processing to some popular binaries on Windows and Linux that would you would think would be uh, where a lot of call site or a, a control flow hijacks would originate from uh, JavaScript flash binaries. And as as we found, um, you know, indirect jumps are a little bit more prevalent on Windows. I mean, I'm sorry, on, on Linux, and uh, that that really you know. We do need to consider indirect jumps uh, as a potential hijackable call site. In this particular talk, we're just going to be talking about uh, indirect calls. Uh, but we thought it was kind of kind of interesting um, to kind of plot that data. So now we had a system where we were capturing these mispredicted branches, storing them, and kind of post-processing them to to see if whether our 
hijacked uh, call was was collected or not. And so this is where we decided, can we do this in, in real time um, and sort of query some sort of wait list and decide whether the the branch destination is is a branch a branch destination that should occur from a from a uh, indirect call site. And so we used Firefox with the Dromeo JavaScript benchmark to generate a ton of, of data. So we had like 160 some million branches. And we basically iterated on that data over and over until we could sort of categorize every branch. Um, and so what we came up with was about two thirds of that data came from uh, functions that you could find in the uh, relocation section, um, which would be expected from an indirect call. Um, we saw some from exports, uh, some some branch data that wasn't actually a mispredicted branch, and then something we call callbacks, which are basically code pointers that are being passed in as arguments to to another function, and then finally a chunk of of uh, branches that are going to to a JIT code page because this is JavaScript. Uh, but the important thing here was that we were able to basically take 167 million branches and whittle it down to zero that we couldn't uh, account for. And so from there, we we uh, decided to try to do this in real time. So in the kernel, we would build this whitelist, and every time a mispredicted indirect call occurred, we would validate the the uh, des destination address to make sure it was a legit destination. And so basically, our, our whitelist generation, each time a new image is loaded into a process we're protecting, uh, we we want to find all code pointer addresses uh, present in that that image. So scanning relocations, exports, the, the callbacks I was referring to, and uh, where a code pointer is basically some sort of uh, address that's pointing into the text section. Um, and uh, so once we had the system in place, uh, um, you know, we, we were uh, pretty satisfied with the results on Linux, but um, Kenny's going to come up and talk about some of the uh, headaches we encountered when we tried to move to to uh, Windows 64-bit. Thanks. Yeah. So the, now that Matt's uh, covered some of the uh, cover our methodology pretty much, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the particular implementation challenges we had when we tried to take this technique and make it into a workable prototype. And I'm really going to highlight three basic things: uh, receiving the PMU, PMU interrupts, and then clearing them once we've received them and the issue of thread tracking, which turned out to be a pretty big deal for us. Um, so receiving PMU interrupts on Windows requires registering with the interrupt controller to get to, to have our handler be called when the interrupt happens. And we knew that we could modify the IDT directly, but we also knew that on at least 64-bit Windows, patch guard was not going to like that and going to block us. So we did a little digging, and we found a... Uh, a mostly undocumented kernel routine in HAL DLL called HAL set system information. And if you pass an information class of HAL profile source interrupt handler into it, it actually has an internal, a really nice uh, mechanism for registering a callback specifically for performance interrupts. And uh, there, it's reachable through HAL dispatch table, so there's a reliable way to get to that, that unexported function. And uh, here's just a little code snippet of what that looks like. Um, I'm not going to dig into it, but it's really just a basic callback registration. Um, and here's some examples of how you would use it. It's very simple. You just create a buffer, passing your function pointer into the function, and it registers it, and then deregistering is the same thing. Um, <clears throat> so once we started this, we were able to register the interrupt. We were getting uh, branch misprediction interrupts uh, correctly in our handler, but we got one the first time, and we realized that we actually have to clear the interrupt and tell the interrupt controller that we had received it and to continue receiving interrupts in the future. And it turned out this was a little bit tricky. It required some work and some research to figure out how to do it correctly, um, specifically because there are two different interfaces that Intel has defined, XAPIC and X2APIC, and which one is used by Windows depends on both their availability and which version of Windows you're running. So for XAPIC, it's been around a long time, Pentium 4, um, and it's the default on Windows 7. And the registers in the APIC are accessed through physical memory, so uh, we were required to map that physical memory into the virtual address space so we could use it. And we used MMMAP IO space to do that and wrote to it, and that was a little bit of work to get that working. Uh, X2 APIC, which is fairly new and is used on Windows 8 through 10, 
uh, actually was really easy. It uses MSRs in, to uh, to talk to the interrupt controller. So uh, that was pretty trivial. We just do a write MSR call to do it. And to do the same thing on Linux for comparison was trivial. There's a call uh, register NMI handler in the Linux kernel that lets you register it and deregister it. And it was really straightforward. This is actually the first one we did. And it took us maybe a day or two to do. And uh, <clears throat> the last major issue and the one we spent most of our time on was the idea of thread tracking. So the PMU doesn't have any awareness of threads on the system or process context. It's always running until you turn it off. And that didn't work for us. We don't want to monitor the entire system all the time. We only want to monitor certain key threads like uh, browsers and office applications, things like that. Um, so we needed a way to limit our monitoring to just particular processes. And on Windows, it wasn't straightforward at all. We actually spent quite a bit of time on trying to come up with a solution for this. Um, there's no explicit mechanism in Windows to say, hey, let me know when a, a context switch happens and a new thread gets put onto a processor or when that, that context switch uh, is ended or when it, the, the thread goes off of the processor. Um, so that was a major problem. We have no way of knowing when that's happening and we had to have a way to track the threads as they were being shifted in and out. Uh, so the eventual approach we, we came to uh, uses asynchronous procedure calls. So according to Microsoft, when an APC is queued to a thread, the system issues a software interrupt, the next time the thread is scheduled, it will run the APC function. So in other words, it's essentially a queue of functions that get executed at first availability, which turns out to be when the context switch happens and the thread gets scheduled for the processor. So that was perfect. That's, that was exactly what we were looking for. It's a, basically a callback to tell us know when a, the context switch happens. But it turns out it wasn't quite that simple. Um, we don't want to track all the threads on the system to know when they get swapped out. We really don't want to know when the ones we care about happen. And there was no way to know when the thread gets swapped out as opposed to in. And uh, also there's a secondary difficulty. If you try to register an APC handler from inside an APC handler for the current thread, it goes into an infinite loop and locks everything up. Uh, so the final solution we arrived at was to schedule a kernel APC for every thread that we want to track. And then we configure the PMU to trap all the most predictive branches when that context switch happens. And we continue to monitor, we continue to apply our protections until we see an interrupt for the wrong thread. And at that point we know that our, our original thread has been swapped out. We can turn off the PMU, stop monitoring, and make sure that the APC is rescheduled for the, for the process we care about. And uh, so when it comes back in, we'll know. And we continue doing that uh, until we don't monitor anymore. And this is a, a diagram of how it works. It's a little dense, but basically uh, the yellow lines are the APCs that are happening. The blocks are the different thread, con or thread quantum that are happening on the processor. And the, uh, the vertical lines uh, are the interrupts that occur. So the red ones are when, like for, if we see an interrupt for calc, then we don't care. We immediately stop monitoring, turn off the PMU, and wait for an APC to happen. And to contrast again, for Linux, this was pretty trivial. Uh, it was nice enough to give us uh, registrations for callbacks when something gets scheduled in or scheduled out. So in, compared to the uh, hours and hours and hours of work on Windows, this was just a matter of uh, a little bit of work on Linux. And we were pretty happy about that. <laughs> Uh, so, so the second section I'm going to talk about are the results. Uh, specifically, the, what was the performance overhead and what was the actual efficacy of this? How did, how did it do in detecting exploits? So as Matt mentioned earlier, uh, we expected to get a lot of interrupts, one for every mispredicted branch that happens. Uh, we weren't, it initially weren't sure how many that was going to be or what kind of overhead it was going to generate for the processor when we were doing it. And there was also, you know, the small uh, APC overhead for the monitoring uh, switching on and off. And we didn't even know if this was going to be feasible at first. So we did some testing. And uh, the main result we saw from the testing was that as the microarchitecture progressed, uh, our, our theory is that the branch mismatch prediction unit gets better. So the interrupts uh, went down over time with different microarchitectures. So with Sandy Bridge and Ivory Bridge, they're about the same. This is for one run of uh, Google's Octane JavaScript benchmark. So it saw between 13 and 14 million interrupts. 
over uh, maybe 15, 20 seconds. And uh, Haswell and Skylake went down considerably. So uh, the end result of the, all the performance testing, we ran out uh, of Passmark and Google Octane under Internet Explorer. And we chose EMET as sort of the industry standard uh, protection uh, product that was sort of comparable to what we were doing just to see what an acceptable level of overhead was that we compare ourselves to. And uh, for Passmark, we saw about a 9% overhead for HACFI, and EMET was about 3%, and that's about what we expected. And for Octane, we were about 7%, EMET was 20%. And we, we were a little surprised by that, but the conclusion we've drawn is that uh, the interrupts uh, really, the, the way the monitoring happens is different. So it varies widely uh, between what different applications or code you're running in the application. So the, the performance overhead shifts depending on what you're doing considerably, um, but generally we see it about 10% or less. Um, and subjectively, uh, we run this on our own systems, under browsers and office applications and things, and we really don't notice any system slowdown. It's perfectly usable. We can stream video and uh, do pretty much anything we want. Uh, so now that we knew that it was, the performance was acceptable and we could actually use this, we needed to test to see how it actually performed against exploits. So we went to Metasploit, we grabbed a handful of uh, Metasploit modules and tested them, and after just a little bit of tweaking, we found that we detected 100% of the modules, which was awesome. But we de decided that testing against Metasploit wasn't really a good test because a lot of the Metasploit modules share a similar method of exploitation. And what we really wanted because of the way the CFI works is a diversity of techniques instead of exploits. We don't, we don't care about the vulnerability as much as how it's exploited. So we went to virus total and we started collecting some samples. Uh, and we, we sort of decided somewhat arbitrarily to, to focus on exploit kits. So we pulled uh, 48 different virus total samples from seven different exploit kits, and that was about 20 unique CVEs for, the, for those 48 samples. And uh, we ran a te an automated test bed to test CFI against all of them. And we also uh, did a little analysis on each sample, and we bend them into three different techniques, uh, general categories. Uh, ones that use ROP, ones that used a, what we're calling a ROPless technique A, which is a, it's a flash exploitation technique that uses a wrapper of Vulture Protect to mark shellcode's executable jump to it, so it's not a traditional ROP exploit. A technique B, which is very similar, but it uses a method out apply an action script. Uh, it was pioneered by Vitaly Toropov. Um, and Cody's gonna go into a little more detail with case studies on how these work later. So. The final detection matrix, we um, were able to detect 95% of ROP, which is 37, 37 of the 48 samples we tested. We had one Technique A sample, which we detected, and 10 Technique B, which we detected 100% too. And EMET did fantastic at ROP, but it didn't detect any of the ROP list techniques. And the same data split by bug class, um, we had more or less 100%. Uh, for some of the other ones, it, the 80, we had 83.3%, and that was really more of a, the, the exploitation, exploitation technique instead of the actual vulnerability. And uh, I think the takeaway from this is that the vulnerability doesn't matter for this technique. It's really what happens after the vulnerability has been triggered. And uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Cody to go over some case studies. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, we're just gonna walk through a couple of case studies uh, real quickly so we have time for questions and whatnot. But this is, again, when we look at ROP, and, and Kenny mentioned ROPless um, A and B, these are things that we're seeing trending over the last two years that are becoming more prevalent than, than the traditional ROP-based exploitation techniques. And it was, it was something that we really kind of were shooting for from the beginning to, to uh, not just stick to, to certain, uh, you know, old, old uh, exploitation techniques. And so with the case studies, we wanted to kind of drive, uh, dive a little bit deeper um, using the first one as a classic ROP technique. And you can see from the instructions here, um, this is a double free in JScript um, for out of the magnitude uh, exploit kit. And this is a, a condensed 
uh, of what happens when that exploit starts. And if you remember, I was talking in the beginning about uh, the phases. Um, this top is going to be the initial code execution, control flow hijack, and then you get into the traditional ROP gadget of a stack pivot um, and some COE stuff, and then eventually uh, virtual protect on the payload uh, to, to begin that process. And with our system um, and what we've been discussing, we see that when we ran our, our testing that, that Kenny mentioned, we actually detect that branch. And so we're able to detect it before uh, it gets into the later stages of the exploitation uh, phase. Uh, EMET, again, you know, EMET's the industry standard. It's recommended in the DOD. It's, 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 it's great. Um, we, we use it because it's industry standard, but we wanted to show it as a comparison to what we're talking about with more aggressive um, early detection. And, and they pick it up eventually in the virtual protect stub because they're hook based so they're waiting for a call to happen so that they can then instrument we're real-time dynamic so as soon as a indirect happens we're checking which is is earlier um in our basketball analogy here where we're getting the block but but tim duncan as he met uh is is going to get it but he may be just be a little bit behind and so then we get into the ROPLIS techniques, and this is the last case study that we're going to quickly walk through. But it, it highlights that, um, you know, this is a, a different bug class. It's a heap overflow. Um, it's, it's flash. It's also found in many exploit kits. But they've, they're not using ROP. So they are using a technique that is hard for uh, hook-based prevention to, uh, to uh, understand. And there's two control flow hijacks, which we kind of were surprised by, but it makes sense when we look at it. There's actually a control flow hijack at the very beginning when the bug is triggered, but then there's a control flow hijack uh, or, con you know, one that we can pick up with uh, the, the jump to payload, which is abnormal, and it'll be mispredicted by the branch prediction unit. And this particular one actually bypasses EMET and, uh, and some others, um, so we, we thought it would be an interesting one to show. And again, we go through and demonstrate that, that the initial control flow hijack is actually um, more related to the vulnerability and that it is a first step before exploitation actually begins the, the, the process where they take over the, the uh, application. And uh, using the performance monitoring unit, we actually pick that up and we can enforce our CFI policy. And unfortunately, um, this is showing the second one, but unfortunately on this one, uh, EMET doesn't even pick it up and it completely gets bypassed. So in our uh, analogy here, they're, they're kind of standing behind um, and not getting the block. And, and again, you know, it, it, this is tongue in cheek. We're not really trying to pick on EMET too much, but uh, we really do believe in, in early detection uh, for a solid, unbypassable, or at least a resilient um, exploit defense. So, some future work, it's not a silver bullet. There's no such thing. Uh, there's, there's kind of work to be done to really flesh this out. Hypervisors are, are the biggest kind of barrier right now. The uh, hypervisors like Zen don't support all the hardware features that we need. They support a lot of them. Uh, the big one is LBR and PMI and LBR events. So um, we did patch Zen. I wrote the patch for Zen to implement it, but after one minute running, it crashed horribly. So um, it's not an easy one, but it, it is kind of lacking there. And then the second one you saw in, in Matt's uh, pie chart that uh, – uh, just-in-time code pages are difficult, and the reason that just-in-time code pages are difficult is because they're unbacked by a module, so it's hard to understand if they're legitimate, if an attacker has heap sprayed or something like that. And um, oftentimes they're just trampling code, so they may be very small uh, pieces of instructions, and that's a little bit difficult to pick out when you're when you're trying to pick out some um, anomalies. So um, it, it more research to be done there. And finally, to wrap. Um, Exploit defense is, is uh, constantly evolving, like everything that we're doing in security. And so, you know, we need to get earlier and better prevention and detection strategies. And, you know, we're hoping this research kind of pushes some of that to leverage hardware. Uh, compile time solutions are great. And, and, and by all means, um, it's something we have to do in a secure development perspective. But we think there's, there's uh, room for runtime defenses, uh, dynamic defenses, things that just enforce CFI, uh, you know, all the time um, on branch mispredictions. And let's not be uh, so focused on the techniques that we know about today. Let's think about, you know, the core issue um, and, and the techniques that 
uh, might come out later or, or, you know, best case, just uh, try to cut them off before they even have those opportunities. And, and kind of finally, the uh, exploits will continue to look normal. Uh, we see it in malware where they're um, starting to use malwareless uh, sys administration tools to, to, ex to uh, um, you know, execute code or whatever, and exploits will continue to do the same thing where they you continue to use legitimate code and, and reuse code. So um, on hardware assisted control flow integrity, we're just huge fans of control flow integrity. We're huge fans of hardware. This was our research to try to bridge the two to, to make a, a real-time defense. Um, and those CFI policies can get as complex as we want them. Again, we're competing with performance, so we do have a powerful place in the interrupt service routine to do additional checking. Um, one thing is we don't add code to user land. It's all kernel, so uh, there's, there's a lot that we can do there. Um, finally, uh, before we open up questions, just, just some thanks. Um, some people in game, Aaron Lamb, uh, Gabe Landau, and Andrea, and then Caffeine runs a great blog uh, where he breaks down exploit kits, and uh, we use that information a lot. So, uh, and finally, fellow researchers on exploits and uh, other vendors working on the problem. So we'll take um, a few minutes for questions, four minutes for questions if anybody has them. I, I couldn't hear. Can you say that again? Oh, false positives. oh false, yeah, false positives. You know, the false positives happen really when you're doing the uh, call site validation. And so we've done rigorous testing to basically browse many websites, uh, you know, try as much as we can to be uh, normal, uh, like exercise the application like a user would. And many libraries and DLLs load. And our whitelist processing can pick out what's legitimate, and then we continue with that. And we haven't... You know, we've seen some false positives, but they're, they're, they're actually surprisingly few and far between. So as long as you're able to identify the relocations and the legitimate call sites appropriately for an application uh, in all the libraries, it's, it's, it's fairly low. What, what microcontroller architectures did you explore specifically? I'm interested. Do you know this, your mechanisms would be available on an ARM processor? Yeah, actually, um, thanks for the softball question. Matt did a talk at, at Recon that he could talk a little bit more um, for, for a minute or so about using it. The performance monitoring unit is on every microarchitecture outside of the really, really small um, commodity ones. Yeah, so... Uh yeah, you, the overall approach applies to ARM. Um, some of the newer uh, ARM V8 cores have uh, events, in fact, focused on misprotected indirect calls. The problem with ARM is that it doesn't have a last branch recording mechanism like Intel, so uh, you would almost have to tie into one of the, uh, the trace either the embedded trace macro cell or program flow trace, if you could somehow combine those two pieces so that, because the instruction skid problem also occurs on ARM, so that uh, validating that, uh, or I should say, getting that precise branch destination is the only kind of unsolved problem. Okay, I think that's it. Thanks, everybody. Okay, good.